Uh, we'll, we'll get going on uh, the last panel of the day uh, on uh, accessing capital for your business. Uh, obviously, as we've heard from a couple of the panels already today, uh, it's been a long day, but, but uh, we've had a couple of panels who have already talked about you know, capital as the key kind of driver and constraint for a lot of things that are going on or could be going on in the area. And uh, that certainly has been a part, was a, a theme in our uh, local companies panel. And it was also a theme, I know, in the uh, biomass biofuels breakout that we just had, uh, as well as some others. So uh, look very much forward to uh, the discussion in this panel and what we have, uh, our esteemed panelists have to say. We have a, a great panel set up here and a great moderator. Uh, Roger Reese is our finance operations director and has a financial background himself, uh, and I'm sure will do a great job. So without further ado, Roger. Thank you, Mike. We're on the, the downward trend now. We're almost done. And we have the most exciting part of, uh, I know, everybody's day, and that's talking about finance and numbers. But, uh, you know, I think as, as we all know, um, this is what makes the world go around. I think that if you talk to a lot of different companies, both mostly small but some large, you know, the, the biggest need that they have is money, money, money. So hopefully today's uh, presentation and panelists will kind of fill you in on their each uh, specific areas. I think there's some good topics that we'll be discussing. And I think we, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get on, go, get on with the program. Um, our first panelist is, is Tom Windrum, who is with the, uh, uh, the firm of McGladry and Pullum, and he is a specialist in federal taxes and uh, federal tax credits and, and incentive programs. Um, I know I spent a lot of time in my early years using the old low-income housing tax credit. Well, that's come around. There's a lot of new, uh, new and different ways to uh, use government financing, which is non-cash. So uh, without further ado, Tom. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I'm the token uh, accountant up here, I believe. And uh, you know, no presentation about energy financing would be complete without talking about taxes. So uh, I, I don't want to uh, take any more than you know, 10 minutes, because I don't want to stand between you and cocktails. So with that, um, let me begin. Uh, there are two popular tax credit programs. Uh, for renewable energy projects. Can we get the chart up there, Roger? Thank you. Uh, and there's also a grant program that's available in lieu of both credits, uh, which is still available for some projects that have been grandfathered, and I'll explain that a little bit more. Many of you, uh, and I'm sure any of you that deal on the finance side are probably familiar with a number of these programs. Uh, the first one, as you see up here, is the what they call the... Uh, Renewable Energy Production Tax Credit under Section 45 of the Code. And uh, this is just a real high-level overview, the different types of renewable energies that you can see up there that qualify for this credit. And unlike the next one, which I'm going to talk about, which is the Investment Tax Credit, this one is based on uh, production, uh, not the cost of the property. So it's based on the kilowatt hours of electricity produced. And it's uh, claimed over a 10-year period. And so it looks like small numbers, but if you're producing a lot of electricity, they could be big numbers. So it's a cent and a half times an inflation adjustment factor. Currently, that IAF uh, takes that cent and a half and it bumps it up to 2.1 cents per kilowatt hour. The few up here that you see that are also uh, three quarters of a cent uh, are inflated inflation adjusted up to 1.1 cent per kilowatt hour. Uh, a couple of things that happened in 2009 with Obama's stimulus package, the American Recovery Investment Act. First is it said that in lieu of this credit, you can claim the Section 48 Energy Investment Tax Credit, which I'm going to talk about next, which is based on the cost of the project. So if you have a project that has a huge dollar cost, cost of the facility is big, like a biomass plant, you might want to go uh, with that credit as opposed to uh, this credit because you might get more bang for the buck. So it allows you to elect in and out of each of those credits, use them interchangeably. The other uh, thing that that uh, stimulus program did was it introduced a grant program. 
that uh, you commonly hear referred to as a 1603 grant. And 1603 is the section of the American Recovery and Reinvestment. It's not a code section. It's not in a tax code at all, other than um, there's some uh, related rules. So um, this new program has been around, this grant program, uh, since 2009, where essentially you can get a grant of up to 30% of the cost of the project, the cost that would be eligible under this grant program. So if it's eligible for one of these credits, then typically it's eligible for the grant. There's a lot of special rules. There's a lot of red tape you got to go through to apply for this grant. A lot of documents have to be uploaded to the Treasury site. They give really excellent guidance. There's guidance on the Treasury website. Uh, they're jointly administering this program with the Department of Energy. I think the guidance is exceptionally well done. It's way better than any guidance that typically comes out of the IRS, which is usually confusing as hell. Um, this is actually pretty clear, and they've added a lot of stuff to it. For every type of document that you need to submit, they have examples. They have FAQs. Um, it's kind of a model for how to run one of these programs effectively, in my mind. Um, the big thing is um, this program sunsetting because uh, we've got this deficit problem, so it hasn't been renewed. And although the Obama administration is pushing to renew this program again, uh, I think with the makeup of Congress right now and, and the focus on the deficit, I, I wouldn't put my hopes on it. It's not the end of the world. We still had the two credits. Those credits are still viable. It just changes the tax structuring a little bit in, in how you do those. Um, the effective date of this program, uh, it, it, there's a grandfather provision. So if you start a project that, uh, before the end of 2011 or before the beginning of 2012, it can still qualify for the grant instead of the credit. And there's also a safe harbor if you incur 5% of the costs before that date. Um, so there's a lot of good information in the Treasury uh, website on this. If you just put in 1603 grant in Google, it's the first thing that comes up. So that's literally the easiest way to find it. They're constantly updating it. Now the ITC, uh, as opposed to being based on production of energy, it's based on the cost of the facility, uh, tangible personal property. So if it's in a building, the cost of the actual building doesn't qualify, but all the, all the related equipment and everything does. And so this is also a pretty generous credit. Um, as you can see, a number of renewable energy types are at 30 percent, and there are some that are at 10 percent. Um, we've done a number of these uh, projects over the years, and uh, one of the main things about the ITC, which carried over to the, uh, the grant program, is the, the credit uh, generally is available to the uh, uh, you have to be the entity that places the property in service and be the original uh, user of the credit. There's ways to transfer credits to other parties. I'm going to talk about that because that's a key part of the finance. Um, you have to hold the property for five years and this goes for the grant program too. This is key. You can't sell it in year four or you're going to lose part of the credit or all of the grant, depending on, on which program you're under. So it's important to hold it at least five years. Um, and there's a basis reduction too. You can't double dip. In other words, you can't get a credit for 30% of the cost of the property and depreciate 100% of the cost of the property. But it's a pretty generous provision because you only have to reduce your basis before calculating depreciation by half of the grant. So essentially you get to double dip on 15% of the cost, which is pretty nice. Okay, now, now we're going to have the obligatory uh, structure diagram that is in every tax presentation. You know, you, you know you're, you're not a real tax geek unless you can draw these things uh, in PowerPoint. So project financing for, uh, which is really what we're all here to talk about, the common model is to uh, transfer the tax benefits to what's known commonly as the tax equity investors. There's a lot of different ways to do that, but here's the basic model uh, that a lot of these things are, are based on, and it's called a partnership flip structure. And essentially what you have is a developer who is the, sometimes it's the contractor, sometimes it's somebody who is actually running the project and may sub out to the contractor, or maybe the general contractor, but there, there's definitely some connection there with the contractor. 
Um, there's also the investors, and then they set up a special purpose entity, most commonly an LLC, that elects to be treated as a partnership for tax purposes, so that's why it's a triangle uh, instead of a rectangle. So you have this project company, and um, this partnership flip structure was originally developed for wind-related uh, production tax credit, or Section 45, uh, partnerships. And there was a revenue procedure, RevProc 2007-65, which the IRS basically spelled out a safe harbor and said, if you structure your deal this way and exactly this way, then you can transfer these tax benefits to the investors and it will be respected uh, by the IRS and you will accomplish your goals and we won't come in and, uh, you know, make you reverse it out. So um, that was a pretty big development back in 2007. And then they started creating all these tax equity deals. It applies to, you can use this, and even though the revenue procedure said it only applies to wind partnerships, I've seen it successfully used in building rehabilitation credits in low-income housing credits. Um, certainly used a lot with um, energy ITC or a production tax credit for other types of energy besides wind. But the key is you got to do it exactly the way it is in the wind partnership. Um, the way it works is in the first five plus years of the project, so from the data's place and service, add five years, and you probably need to go out another year or two until the investors earn their desired rate of return. Um, the uh, or what we call the pre-flip period, the developer only retains a 1% interest. They have to retain at least a 1% interest for this to work. And the investor group will have a 99% interest. The, uh, once you hit the flip date, okay, and the flip point, again, it's based on achieving a desired after-tax rate of return, then the investor has to retain at least a 5% residual interest, uh, and the developer uh, would then take back a 95% interest. And that is an interest, essentially, for tax purposes in each item of income, gain, loss, deduction, and credit. Um, and again, the flip option can't be exercised until at least five years out. This is the basic model. This can get more complex with more boxes and arrows uh, if you introduce a bank into the situation because there may be some bank financing that's part of this, or you may have a a uh, contractor that's separate from the developer, or you may actually have uh, an operations company that's going to run the facility that's separate from the developer, and so you got money moving around this thing. But the key is you got to have these, you know, these elements exactly like that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a summary of the guidelines. Uh, there's a lot more to this. This is very high level. The, the key to keep in mind in these deals is there are many, many traps for the unwary. Uh, I've seen a lot of agreements that people put together that they thought they understood this, and there's like one fatal clause that blows the whole deal. And you have to make sure that you get a qualified tax uh, person to review those documents before you sign on the dotted line. Um, so there's rules on the minimum investment that you can see. There's rules on the purchase option. Essentially, you can't have a call in the first five years after it's placed of service. Uh, no puts, uh, although there's one exception to that. Uh, you can't have the developer cannot guarantee the tax benefits to the investor. The investor has to be at risk, but if you structure the deal properly, they will get the benefits. And everybody on both sides has to understand that, but you can't, you can't guarantee it. You also can't have the developer lending money to the investor, and the developer can't guarantee the loans to the investor. And then there's all kinds of special rules on partnership allocations, which are way outside the scope of this uh, little 10-minute uh, talk. The other common structure we have is a sale leaseback. Sale leaseback has been around a long, long time, common tax vehicle. Um, what you have on the one side is a, is a seller slash uh, lessee. The original owner of the property sells it to a buyer slash lessor. The lessor then leases the property back to the seller. Um, so essentially the investor gets the tax benefits, the credit or the grant, 
and uh, any accelerated depreciation, any state incentives, et cetera. Um, the lessee also typically retains an option to purchase the uh, property back at the end of the lease term. Um, advantages to this structure is you have 90 days after the property's place of service to set this up. So it doesn't have to be in place on day one. And that's pretty important. It gives you a little bit of flexibility, gives you a little bit of time to put this thing together. Um, you know, you can have 100% financing. There's an upside to the developer. If the performance uh, exceeds the expectations uh, that were uh, built into the fixed rent payments, then the developer, you know, gets a, additional, uh, additional money. Um, the disadvantages is you got to, the purchase option has to be at 100%, uh, and uh, there's some other tax limitations you got to worry about. The big thing here is that it has to be a sale, a valid sale for tax purposes, and it has to be a valid lease for tax purposes. There's years and years of case law on this stuff, which I'm not going to go into, but it's, it's boiled down into several guidelines. Essentially, the whole thing has to be arm's length. Uh, everything's got to be arm's length um, and at fair market values. So if you have a purchase option for a buck at the end of the thing, boom, it blows up. It doesn't work. So a lot of things that people commonly do, you can't do if you want the tax benefits to go to the right place. The, key, the good way to think of this is the buyer slash lessor has to have the benefits and burdens of ownership for tax purposes. And so they've got to be essentially the tax owner. And we've helped lots of people with these things. The key, again, is to, uh, you know, review the agreements and make sure that there isn't some fatal clause in there that, that may look innocuous, but it, it transfers the ownership for tax purposes to the wrong party, and it, and it blows the deal. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it back over to Roger, and he'll introduce the next speaker. Thanks, Tom. Um, our uh, next presenter is, uh, by coincidence, with the same firm. Uh, you know, Tom is in uh, Washington, and uh, David is in California. And David is kind of is more involved in mergers, acquisitions, investment banking, uh, capital raising, and and those type of uh, areas. And so I'm going to let Dave tell you a little bit more about that. Thanks, Roger. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I did have some slides, and uh, somehow they're they're not here. But uh, if you ever meet an investment banker that doesn't have a slide deck, uh, actually, this may be the only chance that you'll ever get. <laughs> so I'm going to go uh, stream of conscious and and uh, basically introduce a little bit about what I do, uh, maybe a 30 second infomercial, and then talk primarily about uh, sources of equity. Uh, equity financing, and, and I think uh, we'll touch on debt financing uh, a little bit later in the panel. But um, we, we basically do both. We, we uh, provide privately held businesses with access to capital for buyouts, recapitalizations, uh, and growth capital. And that can either come in the form of, of, of debt or equity. Uh, by, by our nature, we'll, we'll do 30 to 40 transactions a year, and uh, probably half of those will be with private equity groups. Uh, we're structured in a way that is very industry focused. So uh, I run the infrastructure group, I run the energy group. And the energy group uh, had its early foundations, mostly in oil and gas. Uh, recently, as I guess uh, three years ago, uh, we hired a renewable specialist. And so a lot of our focus has been on uh, basically tracking uh, private equity within uh, the renewable space, and that can either come in the form of uh, green, uh, green investment, uh, green private equity fund, or uh, really anybody who says that they're interested in investing in, in clean tech. And we really differentiate that in, uh, I, I guess, equity would come in, in, in really four buckets. One, one would be public equity, another would be uh, strategics. And by the way, as you as you all probably know, public equity is 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 completely dried up. So, uh, you know, I, I think industry wide, even the public, uh, large publics, uh, took it in the chin, uh, both in solar and wind last last year. Um, so they're looking at other ways uh, to to raise capital. But 
Uh, the interesting thing about private equity in renewable energy, and, it, and if I had a, uh, a slide, I'd, I'd, I'd point to a huge disparity in the, the, the level of asset financing versus equity financing. Um, I think in the last probably eight to ten quarters, the, the, the ratio is about 90 percent asset financing uh, to 95 percent asset financing, and then the rest uh, equity. Uh, if you go back to 2007, you really see the, 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 the activity uh, and the, the looser credit markets uh, where the ratio was probably 60-40, 60 debt, 40% uh, equity. But this is the world that we live in. We live in, you know, Greek credit crisis. We live in uh, sovereign debt crises and crises. Um, but I, I think for, for the most part, uh, what we're seeing is the interest in uh, private equity uh, probably is in, in terms of the firms that are saying that they're interested in investing in the renewable space has tripled over the last three years. And the reasons are, are, are pretty simple, high returns and strategic interest. So you have all these huge strategics, uh, international strategics that are looking for platforms here in the U.S. and they're saying, uh, you know, we're willing to pay high multiples. Um, we've, we, we, we track multiples uh, on a regular basis, and um, if you look at just renewable energy multiples over the last, um, well, if you, you know, 2008 was, uh, uh, was, was an anomaly because there was a lot of activity, but um, from 2009 to 2011, you see a steady increase in transaction multiples from eight to, uh, to almost 11. And we just uh, finished a, a biomass transaction last month where uh, we sold it to a Finnish company. Uh, it was a, a 10 multiple. It was a, uh, they, they manufactured fluidized bed systems. Uh, and uh, we had interest from uh, two, quote unquote, green institutional private equity groups. Um, and they were bidding around six and a half times for this business. Uh, but they couldn't get their arms around the backlog because their backlog kept getting pushed out and pushed out and pushed out. Um, but we found a Finnish public company that came in and 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 ended up paying full uh, full value at ten times. And and you know that delta is is it's it's just a huge huge difference. Um, venture capital is another uh, uh, group that I want to touch on because uh, I, I think I read somewhere that they're. Uh, for, for venture capital firms that are saying that they're investing in renewable uh, energy uh, in 2005, I think it was it was 5% of them saying, or 5% or of all money from VCs was going to um, renewable energy. Now it's, it's somewhere around 18%. So again, you see just an, an unbelievable amount of money um, that's seeking out uh, uh, these types of projects. Um, that's all I got. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Sure. Our uh, next uh, presenter will kind of jump down to Jennifer. Um, she, I believe, uh, yes, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is the uh, a principal with uh, First Florida Partners, as well as a manager of the Florida Opportunity Fund, which I think. A lot of people in this room are familiar with, uh, and uh, she's responsible for making a lot of those uh, management and uh, investment decisions. So I think it'd be a good idea for you guys to corner her later on and try to find out where the money is. Jennifer? Thanks, Roger. Um, I apologize as well for not having my visual aids um, available, but we'll certainly try to give you um, as best verbal overview of the Florida Opportunity Fund as I can. Uh, the Florida Opportunity Fund is a state sponsored uh, venture fund that currently manages three um, programs, one being a fund of funds program and then two direct investment programs. I'll provide you today a brief overview of the fund of funds vehicle, but certainly want to focus more, I think it's more relevant for the audience on the two direct investment vehicles. Fund of Funds was launched in November 2008. Um, it was approximately a 40 million, or excuse me, 30 million dollar um, fund aimed at, you know, basically identifying local, national, regional venture capital managers to sort of leverage dollars and look at in investing in, in companies in the state. We've made eight commitments to date out of that program. 
um, and all are performing well. We've been able to leverage over $200 million uh, through those investments, um, looking at opportunities in the state. And um, some of the, the funds provided commitments to include Element Partners, um, Inflection Partners, as well as Stonehenge, the two um, local folks that most of you are probably familiar with. With respect to uh, direct investment programs, we launched in uh, July of 2010 a clean energy investment program aimed at increasing the use and adoption of energy efficient and renewable energy products and technologies in the state by directly investing in, in businesses, you know, for a number of activities um, primarily aimed at um, basically a equipment acquisition, so uh, purchasing equipment that's more energy efficient in nature, renewable in nature by, you know, improving your operations to reduce consumption and or improve overall energy efficiency. That is a $36 million fund. Um, investments can be structured in the form of debt and or equity, and we look at bite sizes between $500,000 um, up to approximately $5 million. Um, uh, second direct investment program recently launched in November of last year is um, referred to as the Florida Venture Capital Program. It's a approximately $42 million program that is, again, aimed at um, primarily small businesses, which is a broad definition. You know, you basically have to have less than 500 employees. You do have to be um, operating in the state of Florida and or setting up operations concurrently with um, any type of funding received out of the program. Bite sizes for that are approximately one to three million dollars. Again, can be structured um, debt and or equity. And all, all programs across the Opportunity Fund are, are somewhat focused on, you know, early stage um, operations and companies. And that's really it. Um, obviously, it'll be around for questions. I also have my colleague here, Hardin Bethay, in the audience available for questions as well. And please feel free to reach out to either of us, you know, post uh, the symposium for additional information. Thank, Thank you, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> our next uh, presenter is uh, Paul Gibson, um, who is uh, with uh, Bridge Bank. Um, they kind of specialize in what their name says in special bridge financing with companies that are at levels where they maybe have operations, need additional capital to get to the next level. Paul, take it away. I cut my presentation down to about 62 slides. So I, don't know <laughs> <laughs> I also came with no slides. Uh, uh, bridge Bank is a California-based uh, commercial bank that uh, is about 10 years old. Uh, its origins uh, are in the Silicon Valley, and uh, the bank's emphasis, uh, at least during the first 10 years, was heavily weighted towards technology and life science, emerging, techno emerging companies in the te technology and life science sectors, and that's a pretty broad bucket, or broad description. Um, we, uh, we launched last year a, a, uh, an energy and infrastructure group uh, really in, in recognition of what we saw happening in, in the clean tech set space. And uh, the bank had, uh, had a long, uh, a relatively long uh, tradition of banking emerging technology companies, Solar City, Enphase Energy, uh, BPL Global, um, around the country. But we were financing the originators of the technology, providing them working capital. As those companies grew and matured, uh, they began bring your, uh, making us aware of an opportunity, a need for them, and an opportunity for us to, you know, provide that next level of capital uh, at the at the project level, and and so we began offering uh, project finance uh, to their end users, to customers. Now, um, in some cases or many cases, they're local, uh, state, and local municipalities that don't require that kind of financing. The, the projects are financed through uh, bond issues, but more and more we're seeing small really real estate plays, for lack of a better description, um, uh, for small solar installations, uh, car charging installations, um, uh, micro plants for uh, alternative uh, fuels, uh, biofuels in the, in the uh, San Joaquin Valley and, and southwest. And then uh, from that, uh, we've, we've branched into a third uh, business, business line, which is the advisory services role in helping marry um, uh, technologies and opportunities uh, and providing the financing or at least helping line up uh, financing syndicates if, if the bank uh, can't, if the size of the deal exceeds the bank's scope, we'll put together lending syndicates for that. And so that's the newest of the three, the three business lines. Um, 
we're we're a uh, we're very interested in what's happening down in Florida. We've been very uh, we've been successful in California because California is is a friendly market for this sector. Um, we're still learning about Florida and and some of the other southeast states. New Jersey, Massachusetts have also we've had some growth there. We actually opened an office in in Cambridge last year, and that 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 office about 30 percent of their first year book of business uh, was in what we would classify as the clean tech space, although again, more on the originating side than on the project finance side, but we expect the project finance, uh, it, will, it will follow uh, the project finance opportunities. And so we're, I'm down here um, actually as a guest of, of the symposium, and I really appreciate you including me. Um, like you, I'm here to learn more, and, and uh, I've enjoyed the panels that I've been on. I'm happy to answer any questions. You know, my perspective is going to be from the commercial banking perspective, which is probably the least um, imaginative uh, source of, of, of funding. Um, you know, hearing Tom and his presentation, um, I've heard the, the code and the, the, uh, the kind of the government angle described as Byzantine, and, and unfortunately, Tom, you didn't make me feel that that's any less true. But... Uh, <laughs> But we, we, uh, but we are, uh, and, and, and I would say this, uh, we, are, um, we are a cautious early adopter. We are in a, entering a space, we're not the first, but we're one of the early entrants in the space of financing these companies and financing these projects. We expect this space to get crowded very quickly. Um, we're kind of tracking to an inflection point where the cost of fossil fuels combined with the regulatory constraints and, and, uh, and some of the political issues uh, uh, with global warming and other things to intersect with, uh, I think, a capitulation on the public's part that, that, uh, that what we have currently in place is not sustainable um, from an economic sense, from an environmental sense, or from a national security sense. And so we, we, we believe that that, and our board believes that that, that that day is coming sooner than later, probably within the next 10 years, hopefully within the next 10 years. And so we feel that the, that the investment we're making in the space today is just that. It's an investment that hopefully will pay dividends as, as you all grow and prosper. So, and that concludes slide 62. Thank you. Um, our, our next presenter is uh, Richard Hostetter with uh, Commerce Centers, which is, they're out of Orlando and, and We'd like to thank uh, Richard, especially his company uh, stepped up and is one of the main sponsors of the, of the symposium today. And thank you, Richard. We appreciate that. And would you mind giving us your uh, insight into your topic? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roger. The um, EB-5 program is a really strange way to get investment. Uh, but it's also um, a very interesting way. And if you qualify, a very, very good way. Um, we can only be, EB-5 is, a, is an investment program for, uh, it's a way to attract foreign visa candidates. So if we go to uh, China, which is the primary producer of, of uh, the visas today, they, um, we can recruit people who want to move to the U.S., they want a visa, they're willing to invest to get the visa, we can do the investment for them. Typically it's 500000 and I'll explain that. In, in a little while, it can be a million, but uh, typically it's 500,000. Um, it's a, um, the, uh, the immigration service called the United States Im uh, Immigration Service governs the program totally. We have what's called a regional center. We have uh, a series of regional centers, as you'll see on that main slide, in which we have partnership interests. And uh, we operate within those regions in contiguous counties. So it's not like you can go to any county in the United States and suddenly conceive a project and bring it to us and we can do it. It has to be in a, in a, in a county in which we have the program. Um, the EB-5 program, I'm not going to go through all of the individual things, but the main thing that happens is when, a, when an investor a visa candidate wants to come to the U.S., um, they invest the $500,000 into escrow with us, we, we take a series of those investments, put them together into a partnership, and have a project that we inject that capital into, either in the form of debt or in the form of equity or in the form of mez, mezzanine debt. So it can be any form depending on the strength of the project. Uh, the key to the thing from the, uh, from the U.S. 
perspective is it must produce 10 jobs. Each investor's investment must produce 10 jobs. Now, that 10 jobs, um, if it's done through a regional center, is, uh, is uh, you get a benefit. You can count indirect jobs and you can count induced jobs. Those are economic formulas that are used, but basically it's more than just a full-time direct job. There is an EB-5 program that's an individual EB-5 program. One person wants to come over and invest in a business, 500000 fine, but they've got to have 10 full-time direct jobs. By the way, full-time equivalents, part-time jobs don't count, only full-time jobs. So the full-time jobs, and then in the regional center, you get a multiplier. Um, the, uh, the investor pays for their own attorney. They pay a lot of the expenses. The application goes in. It takes quite a while for the uh, Immigration Service to approve the uh, investment, uh, the, uh, the uh, individual. It's a tough step. They have to prove that they're legitimate people, they're not terrorists, you know, they're not, uh, it's not drug money. Uh, source of funds, path of funds have to be proven. It runs through Homeland Security. Uh, so all of these rules uh, are necessary to protect the immigration, uh, you know, in the country. But also, um, the big thing for us, for our, from our perspective, is the type of, um, of um, projects that really qualify for this, because that's what you're interested in, and it's obviously what we're interested in. Um, so what I'd like to do is really focus just a few minutes on the, on the necessary project attributes. And I'll start off by sort of skipping to the end to tell you that alternative energy is a, is a, um, uh, a space, an asset class, that does, does qualify. And the reason it qualifies is in certain circumstances it has sufficient jobs to attract capital. If you remember the formula, 10 jobs per investor, well, to attract capital in this program and to go out and have a decent marketing program in, say, China or Korea or Taiwan or Brazil or somewhere else, Europe, you've got to, have, you've got to be able to offer a project that, where you can get 5 to $10 million worth of capital. If you're getting $10 million worth of capital at a $500,000 level, you're going to have 20 investors. That means you've got to have 200 jobs. Okay, so it's a, now, with the multiplier effect from indirect and induced jobs, you know, you may be able to get there with 100 jobs, 100 direct jobs, or less. But it's a, it's a, it's a steep curve, so you've got to have a big project. And we were just talking beforehand that I think probably in the alternative energy space, you know, venture capital is not going to work until it gets to the third stage, where you're rolling it out. You're rolling out into a manufacturing plant, you're going to have lots of jobs, you're going to get lots of induced and indirect credits, then perhaps it does look pretty good. Um, so the job count's incredibly important. Now, the second piece of this is that the only way you can get the $500,000 for the investor is to be in a targeted employment area, which by their definition means that you've got to be in an area where, where the unemployment is 150% greater than the national average. For this coming year, that hurdle in the United States will be 12.75% unemployment. In Florida, we use census tracts to determine that. You can cobble together some census tracts and average it out. So you're not stuck with just one census tract necessarily. Now, there have been some who've gerrymandered it, you know, 20 miles down the coast to pick up a real high unemployment area. That probably isn't going to work, but anything within reason probably will work. The reason it's important is if you're not in that area or you're not in a rural area, and by the way, for alternative energy, the rural area, especially with solar, looks like it's going to really be a, a, a good area because everything outside of a metropolitan statistical area and outside of a city of 20,000 is considered rural and automatically qualifies for the 500,000. And then as I say, the high unemployment areas within those statistical areas and within the 20,000 population plus, those also qualify. If you don't qualify, you've got to raise a million dollars per investor. There's a very thin market worldwide for the million dollar investor. It's out there, 
but it's a thin market. So it's one of our, our basic um, filters is are you in a, um, they call them TEAs, targeted employment areas. Are you in a TEA? Have you got the job count? And the, um, as I said, we do economic modeling to increase the jobs. And then, and then the project itself. I mean, uh, if you think about the investor coming over, and by the way, he gets a, uh, he gets a green card or, or she gets a green card for herself or himself and the spouse and all the kids under 21. It's a conditional green card. It lasts basically two years, at the end of which you've got to prove those jobs were created. If the jobs were created, that family gets a permanent green card. It's a really quick way to citizenship, by the way. I think it's very attractive also for wealthy foreigners who have students in the U.S. It's a great opportunity for them to gift. Their 18, they have to be 18. Gift a child 18, uh, 500000 you know, the family then establishes sort of a beachhead in, in, uh, in, in the states. Another area of uh, great interest is permanent employees. A lot of the businesses here uh, are, you know, are from the UK and elsewhere. If they have permanent employees coming over, instead of using the typical employment routine, which is a temporary type thing, uh, they, can, they can use this as a, as, as a permanent uh, solution for their employees if they know they're going to stay long, long term. Um, the, uh, so the project itself, what we look at is we look at the strength of the project, the collateral of the project, and all of this is really to say what is the exit strategy for this EB-5 investor who has come here from somewhere, China primarily. He wants to know, number one, am I going to get my temporary green card? Number two, am I going to get my permanent green card? Number three, am I going to get my money back? Okay. And so that five-year window, you've got, a five, you've got to, to the, the competitive nature of this thing is such that you've got to get the money back to them in five years. You can cheat a little bit on that, but basically it's five years. And so we're looking at, you know, very hard at exit strategies. And remember, we've got to sell it to the investor abroad. So when we go in our marketing scheme abroad, we've got to sell it to that person that we've got a really good exit strategy. Um, so we take a look at that. They're looking at uh, uh, several different things. First of all, as I said, a minimum amount of, of uh, capital to be raised. The, there are brokers in a lot of these countries. They're not going to look at you unless you're raising $5 million. $20 million is, is a much better number. Um, You've got to have some glitz. The first project we did was the uh, uh, two restaurants and the spas associated with the W Hotel at the corner of Hollywood and Vine in Hollywood, California. That was a, a great project because it had a tremendous amount of glitz. Um, you want to look at the strength of the regional center. How good are they at their marketing? Do they have on-site people in China? We do. Um, and are they good at administrating the process? Because they've got to follow up and follow those jobs. The regional center's got to prove for those families that those jobs were there. Uh, it's a very complex process, but basically um, it's a great capital source if you qualify for these things. And, uh, and we, we think alternative energy, especially with the rural nature of a lot of these facilities, could really, could really be a win-win a, a for a piece of the capital stack, not not a huge amount, but a piece of it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, our, our next presenter is uh, Dean Minardi, who he's a veteran panel holder of this symposium. Uh, and I think this is the second panel he sat on, and uh, we appreciate you being here, Dean. If you would like to go ahead and go tell us a little bit. I have one slide. There, there we go. Is. There we go. Uh, who here is looking for capital? or thinks they're an entrepreneur. Okay, I'm on the panel, these people provide capital. I went to my marketing people and said, I want on this screen a Pac-Man thing because we consume capital, but she was like 22 and had no idea what I was talking about. Anyway, so what I've got, and I'll go through it kind of quick is, this is an earlier version of the slide, I apologize, it's not the final version, but the numbers are all right. 
This is Bing's three-year capital raise, and I want to talk about it, and they put me at the end because we went in June of 2010, we raised $600,000, and we're in the fuel cell space. And we did that with uh, friends and family and founders. So it, when you're looking at, your investors are looking, we have skin in the game. That, that's somewhat helpful. And then we decided to go straight to a Series A, and we broke it up into two tranches, we we're going to raise seven and a half million dollars, and the first tranche which we raised was three million. And you think, well, how do you raise three million dollars? Well, once you get to a, a certain age, is you have friends, you have family, you have people within two degrees of separation that because they know you, irregardless of your technology, will write you a check for twenty-five thousand to a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand dollars. So when you're in a capital raise, you want in your first tranche, you want to make sure you have enough money to get to the end of the day. In our case, we raised $3 million in June last year. And then what we did was we set aside the second tranche, which is $4.5 million for essentially a syndicate. And what we're going to do is work with funds and strategic partners. And I use strategic because all dollars are not equal. Having a crap load of neurosurgeons isn't as helpful as having one strategic who's going to buy your product, our, our MEAs. We'd rather have three people who invest in us that need this than, than a bunch of doctors. So we're in the process of hopefully closing out that second tranche in, in June. And I say up at the top is how do you eat an elephant? Well, you do it one bite at a time, but you always do it in an enterprise zone. Because we're in an enterprise zone, as soon as we close Series A, we immediately become eligible for something called a new market tax credit, $2,750,000 of non-dilutive, self-extinguishing debt. And for those of you who used to be in real estate, it's a real estate investment tax credit. So we get to pick that up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tasty. It's like, it's not, yeah, it's awesome. That's an accountant. I'm a CPA, by the way, recently. <laughs> <laughs> so we pick up that new market tax credit money, and that's a state and federal program that the banks want to offset their profits. It's just sitting there. It's basically somewhat like found money. There are a lot more details than that. And then we go into our manufacturing equipment, and, and we're gonna, we don't want to own real estate. If we can get a deal on an empty building, maybe, but real estate and clean tech just doesn't make sense, but we've got in the market, and Richard and I are gonna be talking, is a two and a half million dollar EB-5 slice, because we have a facility in Regal, China. So we've already got something going there, and then the SBA 504, which is a uh, tier debt that'll come in, it'll actually put the EB-5 investors above the SBA 504 program. So what we're doing is we're raising this money, we're really only raising seven and a half, you know, eight point one million in equity. The rest is 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 debt in he didn't mention that the E B five money is often at zero bips or or fifty or they they want their money back. Not to you though. Oh well I've got my yeah yeah <laughs> But, they're, but the, the the investors aren't looking for a big return no. per se. It's a very well, the regional center wants a slice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They want a slice. So that's kind of Bing's version is, is they put me at the end because we're using a lot of these bits and pieces because the days of just going out with a cool business plan saying I need 10 million bucks and unless you got a Kleiner Perkins or a Koshla or somebody out there and you just, you're sexy, sexy, sexy. If you're baseline manufacturing and clean tech, you got to get somewhat creative and you find investors to do it. And I want to give a, a kind of a, not a, a pitch, a side thing, because we're going to go to all the trouble to do this. Well, on May 13th, we had the Regal Special Enterprise Zone come to Tallahassee, look at our facility, look at our technology. May 13th of last year, the governor was there, shook their hands. They went back June 1st, said, we love Bing. You're one of six people in the U.S. we're looking for. We love Bing. May 13th, on June 1st, we had signed a deal with the Regal Special Enterprise Zone. On July 13th, 44 days later, we had a ribbon cutting on 140,000 square foot facility and $9 million US. When you talk about clean tech, you want to keep your technology here and that's what we're doing, but there are a lot of people that want it and they're going to bet a 
boatload of money, if they can get after something, they're going to invest it because the, the, the Asians understand economic development. They understand. And I'm here at the cocktail party in tomorrow, so those are the points I've got. Thank you, Dean. Um, I know, uh, as you know, uh, we are a recent recipient of, of the uh, Clean Energy uh, Jobs Accelerator Credit, and, I mean, uh, grant. And uh, a lot of our uh, membership and, uh, and individuals that are here today, you know, are smaller businesses. And, you know, they're wanting to know how do we get financing. And, uh, you know, so I think if, if maybe any one of you could take a, a shot at, you know, just a little bit of advice, how maybe uh, your particular company can help the small guy. I mean, this is the guy who has some revenues, has, you know, has a technology that's proven, and uh, he, needs that, he needs that next step. So if, if maybe you guys could just take that question and see and run with it. I'll give because I'm a consumer. Figure out what you need, double it, and figure it's going to take twice as long. And then go. To, then I'll let them in. It's going to take twice as much money and twice as much time. You know, if you're done with Bing, we'll hire you for marketing. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. If you can sell that. Yeah. Paul, do you, have, do you have any comments on that? I would say, and I feel bad for Jennifer because I've known Jennifer for a couple years now. In fact, indirectly, she's why I'm here through her invitation to participate in another conference. So for the third time, she'll hear me tell this little story. But uh, we, 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 we approach capital needs, on, uh, look at it at a, on a continuum. And, and at, at one end of the continuum is the least expensive form of capital. And that is your own self-generated working capital profit. On the other side is equity. Now, there's other people that will say equity isn't as expensive as other things. And I wish I had family members I could go to that would drop me a $25,000 check. I couldn't think of one person when you said that that would drop me a $25,000 check. Man, you, you run in should, good you circles. You to Florida State. I guess so. I went to a liberal arts school, so that's shame on me. But uh, so, so, you know, we look at that. So companies, our customers, look at it and say, okay, kind of your analogy of how to eat the elephant. They say, okay, we're going to exhaust all of the sources of capital we can, we're going to work from this end of the spectrum to the other end, and we're not going to go to the other end of the spectrum. We're not going to skip any steps, and so we're going to say, okay, most of our customers, for, for you know, to be pretty sanguine about it, are in a net burn situation. They're emerging companies. That's the story, right? They're trying to get traction. They're trying to get scale. They're sacrificing profit for growth, um, and so and we like that. We like that story. Investors like that story. Um, so there isn't that cheapest cost of working capital available. Okay, what's the next step? Is there any kind of senior debt available? Typically senior debt, you're trading structure for pricing. You're accepting more structure to the limit that the bank or senior debt provider will provide that at a lower cost. <laughs> Further down the continuum, you've got different sources or alternative sources of capital. It can be called venture debt, mes debt, sub debt, um, but it is still in the form of debt. It, it needs to be repaid. Um, Mixed in there in the clean tech sector, there are grants and other programs available, economic uh, EDC uh, type uh, matching funds, different things like that. And those are a little bit of outliers, but for this sector, they're real. But that's going to be up to you to flesh that out and communicate that to the other constitu constituents on your capital continuum. And then at the end, you've got equity. And so none of you are interested in being diluted down or diluted out. You've got your 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 capital needs kind of budgeted out for whatever it's 12 months, two years, whatever the story is. And uh, you're, you're right, double it, whatever you need. I mean, we, we've seen it. It's, if you don't, you're going to spend your life on that perpetual treadmill of as soon as you finish raising capital, guess what? It's time to go raise more capital. And, and you don't want to do that. You want to focus, keep your eye on the ball and focus on the business. So we, as a, as a senior debt lender, what I go to look for is tell me the story. I see the numbers. Tell me the story. How do you get to these numbers? Who's buying your product? Uh, you know, some of the some of the lenders and the investors are are as interested, and I think maybe over overly interested in who your investors are. What's the cachet? Is it is it that sexy Kleiner, Kozla Ventures syndicate? And look, that brings a lot of value. It, 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 you can't underestimate that. However, who who you, who's buying? Who's buying the product? Who is signed up? to buy. Who's really, what I'm most interested in, who's buying again? Who's your repeat customer? That's what I'm interested in uh, on, the, on the technology side. On the pro project finance side, it's a little bit different because those are, tend to be 
kind of individual transactions versus uh, ongoing relationships. But, uh, you know, we're just, we're, again, we're the least imaginative, least imaginative source of capital up here at this table. Tell me how I'm going to get repaid. Tell me why I should take this risk. I'm going to take some risk. <coughs> Tell me why it's okay. And, and, and that sounds simplistic, but that's, the, that's what the banks are, are looking for is how do I get repaid? How do I tell the credit folks this is going to be okay? And, you know, success is the best indicator, right? So if you, if you say, look, I've got this sale, I've got this pilot going, we'll watch that and, and, and you know, proceed kind of uh, um, incrementally. But the other thing I would say is network. Network, you know, work your syndicate of, of folks, whether it's your angel investors, your you're, you know, I don't know about how much, how much value friends and family bring unless Vinod Kozla is your uncle. But if, if uh, you know, folks like Jennifer, folk, you know, there, there's, there's VC funds down here. There are private equity funds down here. You know, we work with HIG down in Miami. We work with Ballast Point Ventures over in Tampa. Um, they work together because usually none of them want to take all of the risk of funding a new startup venture or an emerging tech company. So they'll bring other expertise and other capital to the table and, and form a syndicate. And, you know, that can be also include strategics. And, and so, uh, and, and again, the strategic that's buying, that's a hell of an investor because they've got a vested interest in your successful outcome, right? If they need your product. But uh, I know, that, that, would, that would be the senior debt answer, at least mine. Um, I'd like to open the floor up to anybody have any questions uh, that they'd like to have for the panel. Scott? No, you can carry them forward. Oh, forward. But there's a difference when you talk. That's one of the reasons that they put the grant program into place, because one of the big limitations of tax credits is you got to be paying tax. Right. And so that's one of the reasons for these structures is is to get it to get the credits transferred from an entity who's not making a profit yet, so they're not paying tax, so they can't use the credit to investors who. Um, are structured in such a way that they need the tax credit. So a big key to that partnership flip structure is that the investors have to have a tax appetite. Okay, so um, that's a key part of it. The grant program, uh, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be paying tax. And that's, that was why that program was so successful. It took, it took that whole issue out of the equation. Down here, your startup and the new market. Tax credits, how you gonna no, that's ITC in 1603 and some of the others. The yep. new market tax credit's an entirely different concept, and it's mm -hmm. U.S. Bank has offset their profits by funding a pool of money that we're able to dip into. It's entirely different from the ITC and the Section 1603 and all that stuff. Yeah. on the building and collect the tax credit to put solar panels on my building. Mm -hmm. If I'm not profitable, I can't do it, but I can. You can get an investor with a tax appetite, right. set up a sale lease back or a partnership flip, and you, you can benefit from the, you know, you can monetize those tax credits, essentially. Right. That's mm -hmm. They'll pay you for the tax credits. Another question. I saw another hand out here. <laughs> Yep. It, you know, it seems so complex, but, but it seems like there'd be a lot of repetitive type formats. Is, is there some sort of a, a boilerplate oh, absolutely. arrangement that, that seems to... There are. I mean, a lot of the, the banks that, that um, play in this space and finance these deals will have boilerplate documents for some <laughs> of this stuff, although I've reviewed some of them and they need it tweaked. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, there, there are, um, you know, certain ways to set these up. I mean, there's certainly, um, it, the interesting thing is you've got a lot of different documents to do one of these, these deals. Um, and they all have to pass the smell test from, from a tax standpoint. Um, but, you know, we've done a lot of work in that area, just reviewing documents and making sure that everything's lined up properly so that you get the tax result that everybody is, is counting on. 
and yeah, there, there definitely, I mean, there, there are, um, and there are companies out there that are developers that will invest in these deals and they're looking for, um, you know, partners to do these projects with. And a lot of times they'll have a standard format, standard structure that they use. And then depending on mix of players, they can vary that, you know, one way or another. And they've got, you know, the array of standard documents and everything. Stephen. This is a kind of nasty question, but it's not meant to be. Uh, the number <laughs> of deals that you have brought to you, how many of them percentage-wise, this is for the whole panel, except for the consumer that you are, how many of them do you find? What's the ratio of uh, deal to no deals? Do you think? Well, I don't fund deals, so I'm taking myself out of that, <laughs> out of that question as well. Uh, we, we operate <laughs> probably on the right-hand side of, of, of his continuum. Um, so sub debt, mes debt, equity, in terms of raises, and and our minimums usually are about five million bucks. So um, we don't we don't do you know sort of the the friends and family early stage seed stuff, um, and 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 or really we we don't do a whole lot of uh, venture capital stuff either. So it's really um, and 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 again we'll, we'll be. Uh, we'll vet the technology, we'll vet the, the, the management team and, and, and opportunity before we, we take it on. But it is a tough question in terms of percentages. Um, you know, it, 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 half in this, in, in, in this market. That's higher than I thought you'd say. Yeah. But they've already done a lot of vetting before they get there. That's why I super qualified it before I said half. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jennifer, how, how does say, the... I can sort of give yeah. some real numbers, um, certainly from the clean energy program in perspective. I mean, we have a pipeline, pipeline of companies that have either, you know, contacted us directly or we've, you know, outreached to and, and directly ourselves. And so we've, you know, looked at and have in the pipeline, gosh, over 400 companies. And out of that program, we'll probably fund 8 to 12. So. Yeah, I'd make, the, I'd make the distinction that we, we get a lot of inbound traffic, um, First of all, we, we unfortunately, we, we tend to screen out um, those that don't have any revenue um, that are, you know, for lack of a better term, they're right out of the garage or still in the garage. Um, so discounting those, those that do have revenue, there's a handful of banks nationally that will compete for that business. Um, we bid on probably one in three of the packages that of, of the companies that do have revenue for whatever reason um, uh, you know we may either we know that the terms are not the, the ask is different than where we can get comfortable or or we feel that, that based on who the investor syndicate is there are certain banks that will um, just roll over for particular investor syndicates and so it's it's uh, sort of the, 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 the it's already in the bag but uh, I would say that, that of, of those that we we see that are bankable um, you know, we bid on if, on, if I bid on 10 deals, I close two nationally. Um, and that's, and, and I would say of those 10, all 10 get funded by banks. So there, there is a, there is a home. It's it, but it is competitive. Uh, it, it, uh, even at the earlier stages. I would say that EB5 has been sort of a quarter last resort in the, uh, in the capital stack <clears throat> until recently. And it's become very popular. And um, if you take the filters, the job count, and uh, the need for the uh, uh, high unemployment, uh, it just automatically filters down. So the people we're seeing, I think there's a pretty high chance that if they pass those two filters and they've got a decent business, you know, we could have some pretty good success with them. But if you took the whole universe and applied those first two filters, it'd be a pretty low percentage. Yeah, well, the, the, yeah, that's another limiting factor in the program is that the uh, EB-5 investors petition for the green card takes about seven months of processing. So the project has got to be one either that you have bridge financing for and can we can take out the bridge or alternatively the project has got to be one that's nine months out, let's say, uh, and you pre-raise the EB-5 money for it. Well, we'd certainly uh, like to thank the panelists for a very informative session.
and uh, we'd like to invite everyone out into the atrium again for a uh, little cocktail reception, and thank you very much for attending today, and we look forward to seeing you.